the thing that you were doing like a second ago, which was maybe chopping up a piece of garlic, is now out the window completely, and your priority now is dealing with your finger that is just pulsing. I just had a pretty insane week, um, and and one of those work weeks where it seems like there's no end to the amount of work that you have to do when you come into the week, and then in the middle of the week something just goes um, and takes out whatever you thought you were going to do for that week. That's not what you're doing anymore. That was my week this week. So uh, I I figure we could talk a little bit about incident leadership and what you can do when you're in the middle of a fire and when something comes crashing down uh, and as a senior manager in a situation like that what's the role that you're supposed to be playing <laughs> so, so there's going to be times when things just don't go the way that they're supposed to there's like a production incident there's a security incident there's some type of thing that comes crashing in from nowhere and all of a sudden that's your priority and that's what you're going to do now uh, I, I'm big into cooking, and so I think about it in cooking terms at times. You know, remember when you're like in front of your chopping board and then you cut yourself all of a sudden. And the thing that you were doing like a second ago, which was maybe chopping up a piece of garlic, is now out the window completely. And your priority now is dealing with your finger that is just pulsing. And this sort of abrupt context switch due to something unexpected and painful um, has become, maybe not in, in the kitchen, but like when it comes to, to my, my work, one of the things that I actually enjoy the most when you wake up one day, and I guess it's a bit shameful to say this, but like when you wake up one day and it's like a big production incident has happened, that type of like structured problem solving under a high amount of pressure is really something I thoroughly enjoy. So I thought I should share just like, what is the role that you should be playing uh, in a situation like that? And what's the best way that you can be supportive of uh, your team? First of all, and, and this is the obvious point, but the first priority when you're in an incident is to stop being in an incident. So anything that's connected to, you know, analysis or why did we get here? Or even casting blame and figuring out uh, if, if that's a thing that you do. Like all of that can wait. The number one thing that you need to do is figure out what the root cause of the incident is, or even an antecedent cause, even just like what the cause of the incident is, and then stop that from happening so that you can transition to a normal state. I, I think of an incident as having a couple of different pieces. What we're talking about here is really the, the first phase of that when you're still in the incident, but that's not the entire thing. An incident has the actual incident, then there's a post-mortem, then there's remediation. So you need to go through all of those cycles. You need to uh, sort out the incident. You need to learn from, from the incident and figure out what went wrong and how we can patch it so that thing doesn't go wrong again. And then you need to implement those learnings and make sure that that sticks in the organization through updated architecture and new processes um migrations what have you what's needed so when, when you're in that first stage when you're in that severe incident there's there's a couple of generic tips and then there's there's some some um stuff that i think is more dependent on where in the life cycle of the incident you are and what type of an incident it is so so the generic stuff is is pretty simple like first of all be a calming uh, element as a senior leader if you're the one that's the most nervous then that's just going to freak everybody out. So you need to, as best as possible, try to be as calm and unfaced and as unruffled as possible. At the same time, though, you need to be able to communicate um, urgency to at least new stakeholders who are coming into the incident. If you need another team's help or if you need maybe somebody from your leadership to chime in, you need to be able to appropriately explain uh, with urgency why this thing matters, to what extent it matters. and you need to straddle the balance between those two things, basically, between um, being a calming element to the folks in the room and uh, communicating urgency to, to folks that need to feel that urgency. Connected to that, you need to understand how actually urgent something is to be able to do that. If you're the person that always brings like folks into a war room for the smallest possible thing or you cry wolf constantly, you're not going to be a good incident manager. So you also need to have some type of intuition about what, like when is this a real urgency versus when is this just, you know, 
a small production incident. Uh, sometimes that isn't really known and you have to make a trade-off between if you should underreact or if you should overreact. And I think you just have to develop that intuition over time. I, I think my, my standard mode is to underreact. And I think that's bit me a couple of times where I realized two, three hours in that I should have acted much more forcefully in the beginning. Uh, but my, my instinct is to try to calm things down. And so that's where I start. The other thing you need to do um, is you need to be the communicator that um, shields the team that is actually doing the working from the stakeholders that need uh, information to understand what's going on. In a big incident, stakeholders might be your PR team. Like they need to communicate, your social team, for example, need to communicate to your users saying like, why is this thing down and what are we doing? You might need to inform the CEO, you might need to inform the board of directors. There's all of these stakeholders that have an interest in understanding what's going on. And, and you need to be a, a, a bridge uh, in that situation between uh, the team that is currently doing the work and your stakeholders that need information. So you need to basically do everything that's required to manage that communication. And that includes reaching your stakeholders in whatever way they need to be reached, which often, uh, if you're dealing with a disparate set of stakeholders from disparate functions, could include, you know, Countless phone calls, Zoom calls, text messages, emails, written communication on, on intranets or whatnot, like all of the different ways that you need people to communicate. And then finally, you need to be an entropy fighter. So one of the things uh, that's going to happen in an incident is you're going to have thousands of different information sources where information is going to be gathered. And People will spin up spreadsheets, they'll spin up chat, Slack channels, they'll spin up all sorts of things. Uh, and throughout all of this, keeping an eye on what's the canonical list of events, what's actually happening, what's happened, what do we know, what are the avenues of exploration. Just having basically a master doc of information is super crucial uh, because you're going to go through so many options if the incident is long running and you're going to want to be able to have a trace of everything that's happened. One thing that you can do uh, overseeing an incident is to be uh, an entropy lessener. Now, in, in many organizations, you're actually going to have like a professional team of, of incident managers. And if one of those folks, you know, this might be people that are your SRE team, or this might be folks that just have done a bunch of incidents before. And if they're running the show, um, then you do all of these things in an advisory capacity. You help them, you take the heat for them for stakeholders, you allow them to focus on the incident. Or you take a step back if that's the best that you can do to support the situation. So I think the final generic advice is to be a gap filler. Like all of the things that I mentioned tend to be gaps that I uncover. But if there's no gap there, if there's somebody that's running things smoothly and they're more competent, more connected than you are, or just more junior needs the experience, uh, just let them run with it and just make sure that you, you make yourself available. The work ethic aspect of that is actually pretty important. Uh, if you as a senior lead sign off and go home and expect people to stay, stay along, I think you've lost sort of your moral authority. So just by demonstrating how important this thing is by, by uh, logging on on the weekend or staying until four in the morning, you kind of have to do that. You have to be uh, somebody that has skin in the game if the folks on your team are going to want to have skin in the game. Now, this, there's obviously like a a, um, a chain here and if you're you're have multiple layers below you and all of those have skin in the game then you should consider when you're just buffling in and causing more nervousness than than otherwise but you know just adapt the context but have it as your basic mantra then, then specifically if you're dealing with like what looks to be a very long-running incident maybe maybe two things that i would call out that is important uh, and number one is planning and making sure that you, you are actually taking the time needed to plan for what's going to happen. And then number two, thinking ahead, which is really the same thing, but, but really different stages of it. So what thinking ahead is, is if everybody's thinking about what the next hour, next two hours are going to look like, you need to start thinking about what the next six hours, the next 12 hours are going to look like, just in case it's going to take six to 12 hours to get this thing done. Planning is when you get everybody together, or at least a few people together, and just figure out what are the next steps? What are we exploring? What are we not exploring? Which avenues? What's the working hypothesis in the room of the thing that we're trying to address? So a little bit different than thinking ahead. 
planning uh, in an incident situation has to be extremely lean. It should be like, let's take five minutes and just regroup or 10 minutes and just regroup. Uh, as the lead, you'll take the notes, you'll do the admin, you do all of that work that allows people to think about generating hypotheses, cutting down different avenues, etc. Uh, a role that you can play here is to figure out if people are thinking through all of the dimensions that you think they need to think through on. This can actually be pretty useful just to take a step back and think through a couple of different angles about, is this the way that we should be approaching this issue? Thinking a couple of hours out, on the other hand, is more about, do we need to call in somebody else because everybody's getting super tired and it's early in the morning? So do you need somebody else to come in and take cover? Do you need to think about if the press and comm strategy people uh, or, or the folks that you're dealing with on that need to be uh, we need to change an approach if things are, are long running, like the user communication side of it. Do you need to change strategy entirely and start devising a plan B if this thing is running, running long? Basically, you need to think through all of the things that sort of sit uh, outside of the immediate sort of cone of concern where everybody is focused. You need to be thinking here, you need to be thinking here, you need to be thinking further out so that you can help in the best possible way with this process. There's tons of really great writing on this. There's great books. There's tons of stuff that you can read on, on incident management and how to be in that room. Uh, that's uh, incident management. It's, like I said, it's like one of the most fun things that you can do if you're an urgency addict and if you're a, if you're a junkie of like uh, chaotic situations. It can also be incredibly taxing if it's something that you get to spend all of your waking hours doing. So... I say that I like it because I get to do it once every year. I, I used to I used to joke that like the the ops people and security people that we that we that I worked with previously, all of them would start balding and and just start smoking um, because of the the intense urgency that's constantly on in that job. You don't want to be in that situation unless you're you're. And even if you're in those roles, you don't want to be in that situation. But you know, every now and then, it's a pretty fun thing. Have a great one, everybody. Um, when you're watching this on a Tuesday morning or whenever, and we'll, we'll speak soon. Thank you.